One of the biggest changes in the American religious and political landscape over the last 20 years or so has been the stunning increase in the percentage of Americans who say they have no religion. We call them the nuns, meaning those who, when asked, what's your religion, say none. There are lots of possible reasons that someone might be a nun, but the primary explanation for the rise that we see is actually as a reaction to the political environment, that as more and more Americans, especially young Americans, associate religion with conservative politics, if that's not their politics, they have a tendency to shy away from religion. They don't want to carry that label. So in a sense, you could say that the rise of the nuns is a consequence of our political environment, but it will also affect it going forward because these are people who do not necessarily uh, endorse socially conservative values. So most of them are pro-gay rights, for example. Um, and they generally don't look for the expression of religion in the public square as something to protect or defend the way those who might be more religious do. And those are battles that we've long fought in the United States and frankly are disputes we are going to only continue to see if only because we've become increasingly polarized on these questions because there aren't very many people in the religious middle anymore. Either you're fervently religious or you're not religious at all. When Mitt Romney first announced his candidacy for the presidency back during the 2008 cycle, there was a lot of discussion about whether his Mormonism would affect him at the polls. Would he be hurt by the fact that he's a member of a minority religion that many Americans don't know much about and has historically been somewhat controversial? And I think it's fair to say that in 2008, it did affect him. It hurt him in the Republican primaries. Now, it didn't help him in the Republican primaries in 2012, there's a little bit of evidence that perhaps it hurt him a bit. He certainly wasn't winning the votes of very many evangelical Christians who are a key component of the Republican base. But of course, he did win the nomination. And upon winning the nomination, there actually is not a lot of evidence that his Mormonism had much of an impact at the polls. Or the way I would put it, based on the data that I've analyzed, is that Rip Mitt Romney's Mormonism mattered a lot to a very few voters, but mattered very little to most voters. And in that sense, you could say that even though Romney didn't win the 2012 presidential election, his candidacy is not unlike that of John F. Kennedy in 1960. He did demonstrate the electoral viability of a member of the Mormon faith that I think does actually speak well of Americans' uh, you know, ability to embrace new religions, not unlike the way John F. Kennedy established that for Catholics back in 1960. The Republican Party currently finds itself in a bit of a bind when it comes to social issues. You could say that it was the conservatives in America, primarily concentrated in the Republican Party, who introduced social issues, first abortion and then uh, the battles over gay rights, into our politics beginning in the late 1970s, early 1980s, when the Christian right became a political force in America. And today, the remnants of the Christian right or the organizations and people associated with it have a very loud voice within the Republican Party. The problem is many of the positions that these folks take are way out of step with your mainstream of the American electorate. That's especially true on gay rights, actually. Even though abortion got all the attention in 2012, as it often does, um, on abortion we see an interesting trend that's not much discussed. While Americans are moving very quickly in favor of gay rights, so think of that as being the liberal position when it comes to gay marriage, they're not moving in the same direction on abortion. In fact, young people today are actually more, be careful how I phrase this, more uncomfortable with abortion than their parents, not necessarily staunchly pro-life, uh, pro but more willing to entertain uh, ex uh, restrictions on abortion, expressing more ambivalence toward abortion. Um, and, the irony of this is that in 2012, the, rather than sort of capitalize on that shift toward ambivalence towards abortion, we have Republican candidates who just went way beyond where most Americans are on the, on the issue of abortion. And I think it did actually hurt uh, specifically uh, Richard Murdoch in Indiana and Todd Aiken in Missouri with their comments regarding um, abortion. But if the Republicans paid a little more attention to where public opinion is, well, actually, they probably wouldn't be in such treacherous ground when it comes to abortion. There's been a lot of attention paid to 
young people especially over the last uh, two or three election cycles and whether they've been more involved because uh, the Obama campaign seems to have successfully brought a, young people, a lot of young people into politics. When you look carefully at the data, at least beginning with voter turnout, you do see an increase in turnout in 2008. It dropped off in 2012, which is a little bit of a puzzle because 2012 was a closer race than in 2008, suggests it's not just competition that brings people to the polls. And while it's true that young people participated, say, in 2008 and again in 2012, a little, a little more than they did in 2004, or 2000, or 1996, if you step back and compare voter turnout, whether it be among the young or among folks who are older, to, say, the 1960s or the 1950s, we're still much lower today than we were then. And then if you look at other ways that people might be politically involved, it's not clear actually that we have seen much of an upswing. A um, bit of a debate over how should we count Facebook likes and that sort of stuff, because of course we didn't have that sort of thing 20 years ago or 30 years ago. But if you look at measures like how often people talk about politics and are they paying attention to politics, it's not clear actually that we've seen an increase among the young or anyone else. Um, and that's probably a troubling development, something we should be concerned about. The conventional wisdom is that the Obama campaign has managed both in 2008 and in 2012 to bring a lot of young people to the polls. And there's no question actually that they have succeeded in bringing more young people to the polls than we'd seen in 2004 or in 2000. That's still not a huge percentage. Now it turns out when you have close elections, a small number of of, of an increase in voters can make a big difference. And of course that's what the Obama campaign was capitalizing on. It's not clear, however, that whatever increase we've seen in participation um, among millennials, at least in voting in the last two cycles, it's not clear that's going to continue because my guess is that it's very closely tied to Barack Obama as a candidate and not his party. And sort of my evidence for that is the fact that in 2010, in the midterm election, we actually had a pretty low turnout election and young people in particular were not especially engaged in 2010. Um, and I suspect that's what we're going to see now that President Obama is, is in his second term and won't stand for election again. In the wake of the 2012 election, there's been a lot of talk about the coalitions formed under the umbrella of each party. And you know, there's a lot of talk about how the Republicans are the party of older, white, highly religious, evangelical men. <laughs> Um, whereas the Democrats are more likely to have minorities and they have more support among women and they have more support among the young and, and uh, you know, a variety of other groups. Um, and it, I think that's a somewhat accurate reflection of who's voting for whom, although we want to be careful that we don't overgeneralize because, of course, you find lots of exceptions. You know, there are minorities voting for the Republicans and there are older white male religious <laughs> uh, men uh, voting for the Democrats. But in general, they, those are probably pretty fair descriptions of uh, where the parties have found their support. Whether or not those coalitions are frozen, I think, is a matter to some extent for history to decide, but given what we know from the past, there's no reason to think that those coalitions will stay in place. In fact, it wasn't all that long ago that evangelicals, just to take one group, were largely democratic in their uh, political preferences. It was just a little bit before that that African Americans were more likely to vote Republican than Democratic. So if you look at the past, it's clear that these coalitions can shift and groups can move in their support of one party versus another. And I suspect that's what we'll see. You know, politicians are very entrepreneurial. I think we're seeing right now a lot of soul searching on the part of the Republican Party to broaden their base, to bring in new groups. I think we'll continue to see that. Doesn't necessarily mean they'll be successful in 2016 in the presidential race, but they will undoubtedly have taken steps in that direction. And so in the medium term, I would not necessarily expect the current coalitions to remain in place. There'll be some flux, there always is. Um, what we've seen over the last uh, 20 years or so is an increasing affiliation between the Republican Party and people who are highly religious, specifically evangelicals. Um, we find when we ask people in surveys, do you think of evangelicals as being mostly Republicans or mostly Democrats? Most Americans say, oh, evangelicals, they're mostly Republicans. That's actually true if you ask people, what about someone who's just religious without specifying what kind of religion? Eh, most people consider them to be um, more likely to be a Republican than a Democrat. 
This has been a problem for the Republican Party in attracting young people who are increasingly secular, who are increasingly uncomfortable with the endorsement of uh, not just religion of the public square, but the socially conservative views that generally come along with that high level of religiosity. And so the Republicans have to figure out a way, on the one hand, to maintain their base. They want to hold on to those voters who are highly religious and are social conservatives and do want to see more public uh, expression of religion. Um, without alienating those Americans who might be uncomfortable with those views. That is a tricky road to navigate, um, and it will be a very entrepreneurial politician who figures out how to walk that line. But it has been done before. You might remember a guy named George W. Bush. When he ran in 2000, he actually successfully managed to balance those uh, two competing demands uh, in, in the, within the Republican Party and was quite successful in doing so. So it's not outside the realm of possibility that there could be another politician pop up maybe in 2016, maybe in the next cycle, um, who would be able to figure out how to make this work. When I first began graduate school in the mid-1990s, there was not a whole lot of political science being done on the question of religion's role in American politics. I found this kind of puzzling. At the time, the religious right was ascendant in American politics. Um, I had been an undergraduate at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, where religion is just everywhere. <laughs> and so it seemed a very natural thing to study, and I was a little surprised when I came to graduate school and discovered that there really weren't all that many people who studied religion as a force in American politics. And so I was very fortunate at that time to sort of get in um, when the stock was cheap, and now the value of, his, of it has increased. And it's worth noting, actually, that one of those pioneers who figured out the importance of religion in American politics and was working on it well before the rest of the world caught up uh, was actually Ken Wald here at the University of Florida. And it's really to Ken's credit that um, he has really been a trailblazer in the study of religion and politics. And many uh, scholars like myself owe Ken uh, a great deal of gratitude because um, he really kind of laid the groundwork for many of the concepts and, and such that we study now.